October. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I feel I try and start the podcast in like a different place every time and it I never fucking works. I always end up <laughs> starting in the same spot, which is like, how did you get to where you are? So like childhood to now. Oh god. How long do you have? Like in five <laughs> minutes if you can. What's your journey been? Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I don't know if you know this, but I'm originally from Israel. I, I did, yeah. Israel, yeah, and uh, lived there for 30 years before I came to the UK. And this is, I mean, what I'm doing now is probably career number six, but I initially trained to be an attorney and I practiced law in Israel for a couple of years. I did employment law. Okay. And my intention in going into law was to do good like I really I was that naive I probably still am by the way like my, that is my goal is to just do good and make things better and I was so disappointed <laughs> by the legal system and the realization that the law is so flawed so flawed and it was just it really kind of was quite devastating so decided fuck that I'm gonna move to the UK and become an actress <laughs> which is what you do um, so I came here and I and I retrained and I did an MA in performing arts at Mount View in London and the, the goal was just to be here for a year I was just coming out of a divorce and uh, it was a good kind of like let's get away for a year and, and re- have, have a reshuffle uh, but then I met my husband Mike uh, on a dating site <laughs> and uh, and then decided to just stay and then 17 years later I'm here um, I Act, I worked as an actress for a few years, uh, you know, did several shows, a few films, different things. And then I had three kids in the space of two years and that career was over. <laughs> okay, so I had two kids in the space of two yeah. years. You are hardcore. Yeah, <laughs> it was twins, twins. You wow. know, that, yeah, that was it. So it was very difficult. Um, anyone who is in performing arts will tell you. It's like they don't give you a lot of preparation. It's like, oh, can you be there tomorrow at 11? You know what it's like with childcare, right? Um, Impossible. Yeah, and you're like, well, no, I can't. <laughs> I can't. Um, so, yeah, and then I did bits and bobs. And at some point, 2015, I was, I was really at the point of desperation in terms of motherhood because it was so hard. My mm. beginning in motherhood was not easy. I was not that kind of picture perfect mom who got it, who had it all figure out. Like, no. Uh, I saw people doing blogs and I was so not in that world at all. But I one day just sort of Googled, how do you start a blog? What is a blog? And I found WordPress put on put out my first article which was called I love my kids but sometimes I wish they would fuck off and it just went viral overnight complete coincidence no plan no intention behind it and I've always been a writer like I've always written stuff and you know it wasn't but I I, you know I didn't didn't have any plan to do anything else and then I saw American vloggers so this was at the days that Facebook was at it uh, at its height mm. and I saw these Americans doing these vlogs and all it was really they were just complaining <laughs> about their life on social media in a kind of like a funny way a ranty way and I thought well I know how to do this because you know I'm an actress I'm very good at complaining uh, I know how to work a camera because in the years that I was an actress I also produced a few films and I learned how to edit and I did all of that uh, and I thought I'll just give it a go and that's when it suddenly exploded. I had literally 300,000 followers within weeks. It was so fast. And after a few months of doing that, and it's, you know what it's like, it's like a full time. People think social media is just like you get up and you do a little video and that's it, but it's actually quite time consuming. I was working in an office and I said to my husband, I, if I'm gonna give this a shot, like a real shot, I need to quit my job. And we were totally relying on my income, like we had, two kids in nursery and we, yeah, we need expensive. we needed the math. Yeah. <laughs> and we sort of sat down and kind of did the math and he said well I think three months no we can we we're okay like can you just see how it goes and I said yes and I quit and the next week I got approached by an American agent who said I think I can I can help you monetize and I was making more money than I was making in the office like within a matter of weeks it was such a coincidence. I'm so grateful like for the opportunity that, it, you know, that came, all the opportunities actually that came after that. Um, yeah, and here I am now. Here you are. I'm and sitting on the couch. <laughs> a few years later, yeah. You know, I've written two books now, which I'm so proud of. 
Uh, I've done a one-woman show. We'll maybe talk about that later, but I'm doing another one in London uh, in, uh, in, in 10 days. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a heck of a ride. But my goal has still stayed the same, which is to make the world better. I know it's such a fucking cliche and it's not sexy, uh, especially not in the world of social media where people really like the whole like show bit. But mm. that's not what I do and that's not who I am. Um, and that is me. In a I think show. one of the things that really attract, like, so I've been following you on Instagram for fucking ages. Like, mm. your reels are bring so much joy to my life. Because, I mean, as a mom, like a single mom as well, and I'd love to dig into your divorce if you're happy to, because sure. I'm going through one at the minute, and oh. I'm 30, 31, so Same probably age. a similar yeah. age. Um, and your the the realness and the um, sarcasm and like just like it's so relatable, like. You know, I love my kids, but sometimes I want to fuck off. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, sometimes they're assholes. Yeah. <laughs> totally relatable. So I wanted to get, go, go kind of full circle to what you said initially, which is the divorce piece. Like, you get divorced, you're in Israel, you come to London. Like, how did you navigate that whole situation? Because I feel like, certainly from my perspective, when I was like, right, I'm, I'm leaving this yeah. situation. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, what do I do now? Because your whole, particularly as a woman, your whole life, you're kind of geared up to get married, settle down, have a couple of children, have a nice house, have a nice car, go on a couple of holidays a year. Like that's your, you know, nirvana. And when I got that, I was like, hmm, kind of don't really want this. Yeah. <laughs> it's devastating. For me, it was really devastating. I don't know what your um, specific situation is, but I loved him so much, even when we broke up and I was the one that instigated it, the, the, the breakup. But I really loved him. Mm -hmm. And I tried so hard to hold on to that relationship because I had invested so mm -hmm. much in it. You know, years, all my 20s, you know, and I had the dream. And it's so hard to let go of that dream, of the happily ever after, you know, and we had the big wedding and the families. And you feel like you let everyone mm -hmm. down. I don't know if you mm -hmm. feel that way. But I was so devastated. And I think for a whole year that I was here in London, it was a whole year of really mourning that relationship, you know, really kind of trying to fall out of love with this person, you know. But... And I, I've written about this in my first book, Fucked at 40, and I talk about it a lot. Sometimes relationships end. Mm. And sometimes they end when you still love a person and it's so fucking hard to walk away. But if you know in your heart of heart that that's the right thing to do and that there's something you deserve better, right? You deserve the better than you do it and you get over it and I swear to God that when I was crying myself to sleep every night for a whole year I never I didn't think I would ever love again mm -hmm. I was that crushed but I but I did find love again you know and I just encourage anybody who is in that situation to know that if you're going through a really rough time at the moment it's normal and you know and and it'll pass you know it takes time but it will pass yeah. I, it's much harder, though, with children, so I can't mm. imagine. For you, it's probably much more of a challenge. I think it's all subjective, isn't it? Like, yeah. uh, people's challenges, whether, you know, you can look at other people and be like, oh, my situation's so much worse than theirs, or, or look at someone yeah. else and be like, their situation's so much worse than I think it's just subjective to whatever your your mm. life is, right? Like, I don't think anyone has an any harder or less hard situation. Mm. It's just, it's subjective to, your, to you. Um, but I can totally relate to that, like, you coming to the realization that, like, doesn't matter how much you care about or love someone, you have to choose you. Yeah. Um, and I always say to people, like, you are the most important person in your life, so you have to protect you at all costs. And sometimes that means disappointing people, and sometimes that means letting people down. But I guess you only get one shot at this, right? And if you spend at least a portion of your life unhappy, then, like, it's not worth it, is it? You've got to just do what's right for you. I think it's such a great thing to sort of uh, live by because uh, I think for a lot of people people think that means you're selfish mm -hmm. when you say stuff like that and I think I think it is selfish but I think selfish is a good thing yeah exactly yeah. I'm like okay and what <laughs> okay, and? So, like, to think about it like we're born selfish anybody yeah. who has children will say this is true yeah, yeah, yeah. you know kids are born into the world totally selfish yeah, you know, assholes you, yeah assholes <laughs> expecting everything and then we teach them to be considerate and of course we want to be considerate of course, but like you said, there are moments in life that you have to choose yourself. You have to be on that priority list and you have to be really high in the priorities 
possibly even the first thing on the priority list, you know? Obviously, when you've got a baby and you've, you know, you're know you caring for an infant, of course, you know, you put the infant first because they're helpless and they rely on you. But do you know what I mean? Like, I 100% So many agree. women, and especially moms I know, and I ch- chat to a lot through my community, just complete, and I lost myself. They lo- We lose ourselves, mm. especially in motherhood, I think. I don't know if a lot of your listeners are mothers. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of, I mean, it's very broad, yeah. but I mean, Parents. I de- can relate to that so much. Yeah. There was like, particularly with my first, my first child, my daughter, I had postnatal depression undiagnosed and I didn't know what it was until I'd come out of it. And I was like, oh wow. Okay. So crying every day for six months probably wasn't normal. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like wishing, I thinking I'd made a mistake was like not a normal thing to think. Um, but definitely with the second as well, I think... <sighs> I went back to work really fast because I was just desperate. Like three months after the baby, I was like, I need to go back to work. I was barely even healed from my C-section. I was still breastfeeding. And I was like, I need I need to feel like Amelia again and not the kid's mum. Yeah. I think, and I think that could be quite damaging for a lot of women's self-esteem. I don't know if you experienced. Yeah, it's so weird because literally the same thing. First pregnancy, postpartum, didn't know until I went uh, to see a doctor and they were just like, this is like I think two years later, and he he asked me about the her the birth my birth story, and I just burst into mm-hmm. tears. And I was talking about like the after and the months after, and he was like, I think you had postpartum depression. I didn't even know what it was. And then second time round, yeah, went back to work so quickly. We got someone to help with mm-hmm. the with the twins. Um, but in terms of self esteem, of course, I felt like my identity was lost because I honestly didn't know who I was. And you don't realize when it's happening. It's like that frog that gets cooked like on a slow. Did you? Yeah, did you know the that? cold water. Yeah, and they the cold water. They don't know they're dying. That's how I felt, you yeah. know. And then when I was forty, well, actually forty-two, I that kind of penny started dropping, and it had to do with the age of my kids as well because they were like mm. five. They knew how to wipe their own bums. You know, <laughs> life started kind of becoming less intense and that kind of like they need you for every single thing. So it allowed space for me to go, okay, who, what? Like, who am I now? And I, I suddenly realized that I had completely lost myself mm. in this amazing thing that is parenting and motherhood, blah, blah, blah. But I had lost myself. Um, and that's kind of what the book Fucked at 40 is all about because I went on a massive quest I did a bucket list I went out and did loads of things to just find me to come back to who I am Uh, and I put myself first completely to the point that people would see me at the you know the pickup once in a blue moon and go oh nice to see you you know (laughs) your husband is such a saint and I'm like six years I did this every single day no one ever gave me a medal (laughs) You know? I would love yeah. to dig into that because I could like, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to the book in a minute because I really want to talk about the book too, but I just love that you just said that because all the time, and I get, I'm divorced now so I can't speak on behalf of my ex-husband, but we're well, getting divorced, but all the time, like I would do the, the typical mum stuff, right? No, like take them to the park, take them to the swimming lessons, I like, do everything. No one gave me a medal. Yeah. If he literally did one thing, like pick them up from nursery, being like, oh, he's very hands-on yeah. dad. I was like, of course he's fucking hands-on. It's his <laughs> child. <laughs> like, he used to drive me insane. Yeah. There's such a disparity between parents, like mothers and fathers. Like, where do you think that comes from? Well, I think it, it you know, it's, it's, it's so embedded in our society. You know, it's uh, the sexism that we live with from a, a long, long time ago. I do think it's getting better, if I'm being honest. Like when I look now at the school uh, playground at pickup or drop off, I do see much more dads than I did back in the day when we were like doing the nursery. Because honestly, for six years, I did it every single day. Mm. Just me. Mm. Um, so I hope, I think it is getting better. Um, but yeah, people still say that. They'll still go, they'll still say, but Mike actually calls them out on it now. He'll say stuff like, well, why wouldn't I? You know, like, he knows everything about the kids. He knows them just as well as I do. Look, we have three girls, and I think in some cases they prefer me to mm. be there or to chat to me about certain things. But he is 100% involved in every single aspect of their lives, just like I am. Even more sometimes, you know. He'll he'll arrange the play dates with other parents. He'll, he'll do it all. But why wouldn't he? What a privilege to be able to do that. 
and actually for the kids to have that type of relationship with their dads. Mm. Like my dad, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and obviously back then it was like, you know, you never saw your dad during the week. I only saw him on the weekends because he would come home so late during the week. And, you know, it's a shame because we didn't have that type of close relationship, which Mike has now with our daughters, which is fantastic. You know? I was the same. I grew up, like my dad, so we, I grew up in Australian originally. My dad's English, my mom's Australian, grew up in Australia, was born there. Um, and I, my dad used to work on English time in Australia because uh-huh. he was a trader. Like he, was, he worked in, I think it was commodities trading when he first started out. So he would work English time during the week and then the weekends would just sleep all weekend because obviously he'd been up all night. Wow. So like we, I mean, no shade to my dad. I love my dad. We have a great relationship now, but like we just didn't see him. Like for the first like six, seven years of our life, yeah. like he just wasn't there. We saw Did him they, sometimes. Are they still there, your family? No, they live now here oh, in Chiswick, okay. like down the road. So, um, which is great. Like yeah. they moved all of us over here, which is why, why I've ended up yeah. in London. But yeah, like it, it was very, very different growing up then to even growing up, I think probably in the in the 2000s like I think yeah. we've come as you said like a long long way since you know you you and I grew up um let's go back to your book fucked at 40 um that's two reasons first of all the title <clears throat> epic love it <laughs> also for anyone that's listening to this Toba's currently wearing earrings that say fuck it on them and I'm absolutely <laughs> obsessed like we had a conversation before we started recording I was like where did you get your earrings from I need those earrings <laughs> um so first of all where did the book how did the book come about because it sounds like you did a lot of soul searching and a lot of like you know, looking inwardly to get to that point. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of always thought, oh, I really want to write a book. And I was, uh, you know, I, I sort of had people say, oh, you should write a parenting book or maybe a how-to book or maybe a funny book about parenting. And I had no interest. Like, it mm. was just not what I wanted to do. And then at 42, I had this uh, health scare. You know, I thought maybe there was something on my breast, blah, 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 did the whole mammogram and all thing. Turned out to be okay. But the point is that that was the sort of the kick up my ass that I needed mm-hmm. in a way. Because it suddenly dawned on me, God, life is so short. What am I doing? Like, because uh, for five minutes, I mean, it was mm. longer than that. I thought maybe this is breast cancer. And I thought... I just don't really want to sit and I don't want to wait for anything. You know, life is precious. Just get on, get on with it. Do Mm -hmm. it like whatever it is. Just do it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, And uh, so I, and then I realized that sort of like the, I've lost myself and all that. So I made a massive bucket list of things that I wanted to do. And they, they were a combination of things that I felt like I had lost. So like, I love adrenaline. I'm a adrenaline junkie and I lost that. Like I lost the thrill of doing like scary stuff and whatever. So I booked a bungee jump. Do you think and then, being a parent made you risk Oh worse? God, it makes you so, it, I, I, yeah. Because when you're in your 20s, you're like, yeah, I'll jump out of plane. <laughs> oh, 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 you got to work yeah. the next day, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll go snowboarding without a helmet. Like, no problem. You know, it's like, you don't think. And then suddenly you're a parent, you're like, oh, I don't want to leave them. God, what if I die? I have responsibilities. Like you, you completely change that. So I, I made a list. And there was loads of things, you know, I took a pole dancing, that. that was part of like, I want to reconnect with my sexuality mm-hmm. and just feel sexy and all of that. I did a nude fo- photo shoot, I, I traveled to Nepal, I did the Everest Base Amazing. Camp with my brother. Uh, so we did like a bunch of stuff. And then a friend of mine, as I was planning all these things, said to me, I hope you're filming this. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh yeah, I should probably film it. So we documented the whole thing. And then I released it as uh, web episodes, uh, web web episodes on Facebook, and they kind of like went viral. And it was amazing. And then it got picked up by Amazon Prime. We made it into a film, and it was on Amazon Prime for a mm-hmm. while. And and then after that, I felt now I have a book. Like I have a story to tell. Like I I want to tell the story. And actually, I do talk about the divorce there. So I go back and reminisce like things from my childhood and and the fir- my first marriage into motherhood mm-hmm. and then onto the bucket list and the fuck it and I call it cuz I think 40s your 40s as women is your fuck it decade I truly believe that I think 20s are nice fun blah blah, blah. 30s usually you know you kind of find your maybe your work and motherhood and all that but 40s you come out just going fuck this shit I don't have time for any of it. Like, I'm just going to do it my way. I don't care. I don't need to be cute anymore. Yeah. Like, I've done my time. That's it, you know? And I love it. I And 
you know, I think we're going to talk maybe about this uh, Kim Kardashian post that I did talk about aging is a topic I'm really passionate about because I think we're so obsessed with this idea that like women, uh, you grow old as a woman, that's as a woman, that's awful. It's the worst thing you can do is age. Well, I can't wait. I think it's brilliant. I think every day that passes, we get better, and mm. women in particular get better because I do think that when you're young as a woman, you're so restrained by so many expectations from society, and when you reach that age where people go. Mm, then you go, oh, great, I'm free. No one cares anymore. Fantastic. Someone yeah. asked me the other day, would you rather have the mind of a 90-year-old and the body of a 30-year-old or the mind of a 30-year-old and the body of a 90-year-old? And I was like, obviously, the, the mind of a 90-year-old. Like, yeah. the, the knowledge that you accumulate over a period of time. Like, I can't wait to be on a beach in the south of France when I'm 96 with some beautiful camp um pool boy cleaning my pool just covered in diamonds like that's where i want to that is what my heaven looks like to me I just like that. lying on a beach somewhere with a glass of rosé covered in diamonds massive sun hat like very joan collins vibes yeah. like that that's what i'm headed for but you're so i really want to pick into you know as you mentioned there the kim kardashian post i think she said um i don't know whether it was a pr stunt or whether yeah. she actually meant it you never really know with the kardashians do you but she said that she would, if she, if she knew that eating poop every day would make her look younger, she'd do it. Yeah, something along those lines. It was, uh, I think, for the uh, in an interview to the what was it, the New York uh, something like that about line? her new skin. Yeah, line. because of her new line. Uh, I'm guessing it was a joke. Obviously, we hope. like I don't, I don't really think she was going to eat poop. You know, but and and my post wasn't really about her. Really, it was more just about that kind of culture mm. that oh God. I mean, people do they go to real extremes to try and maintain their their youth. Mm. And you know, I moisturize. Like there's certain things I will do. You know, it makes me feel good. And you know, my skin feels nice and <laughs> soft. But uh, I'm I I'm not so interested in those things. And I. And I, I do think they're a waste of time. And I feel also, honestly, the talk about it is such a waste of time mm. about the, the exterior. Because really, when you look at it, women's rights and women in general are my passion. It's the thing that I really try and talk and use my platforms to promote as much as possible. And I'm thinking, wow, women's rights are under attack in so many parts of the world. There are so many important things happening right now. I don't give a fuck what we look mm. like. It's so 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 mm. boring you know um so and it's so dis- much more than how we look yeah and to me it's disappointing uh, you know i under- look kim kardashian is a businesswoman and good for her like honestly she's um she's good for her it's, it i know and i know she does do uh stuff for her passion as a prison mm. reform in america great but i do think that you know the balance <laughs> Between, you know, that exterior conversation that's so dull to what actually, you know, those type of massive platforms could be used for um, isn't balanced. But then again, she's not the only one. And it's not just women. Let's not attack women here. It's There's a lot of men that have amazing platforms and what they do is just, you know, they... they they go on silly rockets that look like uh, dildos to the moon, to, you know, to space. <laughs> Phallic instead, Exactly, instead of doing something good with the lots of money that they have. So, you know, it's it's a criticism, I guess, about everyone, not just her specifically. You posted something about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and lost loads of followers. <laughs> and I think it's quite important to mention that because you said they're like, they could use their platform, but they don't. And I wonder whether they don't because they know that they'll lose followers. Because people follow people it's different for everyone but a lot of people follow people like Kim Kardashian you know the Kardashians generally or other quote unquote people of influence because of the way they look particularly when you have platforms like Instagram that perpetuate look how beautiful I am look at my yeah. you know beautiful Lamborghini look at my amazing house in Calabasas blah blah blah, blah. people buy into that oh wow that's amazing like I want to feel connected yeah. to them and I want to feel connected to that well so I'm going to follow them whether it's consciously or subconsciously and I do wonder whether there is a fear on the side of the, the person holding that influence of like, oh gosh, if I actually use a platform to talk about things I'm passionate about, I'm going to lose those followers. I mean, to be honest, they're just, uh, they're just uh, pawns. Mm-hmm. The real issue, the real people I have an issue with is brands. Mm. Uh, I, I know you come from the world of branding, so mm. I don't know like what insights you have on this, but at the end of the day, brands want to sell us shit. Mm. I hate shit <laughs> in general. <laughs> it doesn't make you happy. I don't think you need to have a lot of stuff to have mm. a good life but 
if we convince people that if they have X, Y, or Z, it will make them happy, mm. they will spend their hard-earned money on the shit that we make. Mm. Now, we know it won't make them happy, and then in a few months, we will invent another shit <laughs> to sell to them again. So, you know, influencers and people like Kim Kardashian and others, they're, they play a part in that machine, but the machine is capitalism. Mm. The machine is this idea that we need more and more and more and more to, 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 be to be happy, you know? It's, re- it's ridiculous. It's yeah. not true. And I do think they prey on the misery of a lot of people. People mm. are, you know, hardworking. Uh, money is not an, you know, is uh, some people, you know, struggle, are really struggling. Mm. Um, and then they see an inspirational life and someone tells them, if you only do this or that or buy this or that, you can have that type of life. Mm. And they want to believe that story. You know, and as someone that does work on social media, I can tell you, and I'm sure you know this for a fact, most of it is not even real. Mm. It's fake. I know so many people, I know them personally, whose lives on social media have completely do not reflect mm. their real life mm. in, in at home. They don't. Mm. Not personally, not their relationships, not how much money they have in the bank, none of it. Mm. It's all for show. I mean, not all of it, but a lot of it is for show. Because it gets likes. Yeah, because it gets brand deals, mm. because the machine keeps moving, you know? Mm. And even though, you know, you say it, and I know a lot of people say it, you still, you know, it's still hard to, um, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, because I'm totally on your side of this, by the way. Like, I, as, as, and I kind of full circle back to what you said earlier, you got to 40 and you said, this is my fucking age. I feel like my 30s are my fucking age. That's so great. And this might be because I had children quite young. Like, yeah. I had my kids when I was, like, mid-20s. So I'm probably 10 years... And got married when I was, like, 26. So probably 10 years prior to, to the yeah. majority of people, particularly in the UK. But as part of that fuck it stage of being in my 30, like, I got rid of loads of stuff. I sold loads yeah. of things I had. Like, I now only wear, like, the bare... Min- like, you know, I'm sitting... I'm admiring all your jewellery, but I literally wear, like, three things every day. I never wear earrings. I've got rid of loads of, like, designer stuff that I thought when I was younger, buying yeah. the Louboutins and the Jimmy Choo's are going to make me happy. And what I have now are things that I've... Re- when I say things, I mean, like, you know, clothes and items and, you know, my lovely stuff that I have in my house. <laughs> stuff like this. Um, but those are the things that really make me happy and I really care about. And then when I look at brands like Boohoo, Misguided, I mean, Misguided has just gone into administration, haven't they? But Boohoo, Misguided, you know, Pretty Little Thing and stuff. I'm like, you're literally preying on 21 to 22 year olds who are looking at people like Kim Kardashian, who are looking at people like Molly May, etc., and buying into these lifestyles. And as you said, actually, yes, we know the Kardashians are billionaires, but like, do they really live the life that they're posting on social media? Probably not. I guarantee you they're at meetings nine to five every single fucking day in sweats. Like that is going to be the reality of their mm-hmm. life because you don't build a business that big purely off being, you know, this glamorous, you know, glam every day, heels every day. No, you're in an office making deals, making it happen. And I do, like you said, I just think it's perpetuating this machine of like, if you buy that item of clothing that you probably can't afford on Klarna, it will make your life so much better. But actually the feeling of buying that item is gonna only last about seven days anyway, and there's gonna be another thing that you need to buy in order to improve your yeah. life. Um, and it kind of goes for, I don't know if you've seen the study, I'm like flip flopping all over the place, but like I just love what you said there about you know appearances and, and the reality. I don't know if you've seen the study where it said that um, people would rather, there was like, a, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was more than 50% of people would rather have an electric shock than like feel like they weren't a part of like, everyone else wow so that is i think so that's like the that they weren't what do you mean like like they weren't a part of like the cool like yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like society they weren't connected yeah. to people in some mm. way whether they had like some kind of status wow. thing to match or whatever so and like just, a rejection feeling yeah, is worse so than, telling wow where was this study i'll send it to you wow. it, was, it was done a couple of years ago okay. but it was really really interesting it was all about the psychology of like people yeah. and like feeling alone as yeah. well yeah, yeah like they did they did a couple of other studies another one was an electric shock versus feeling alone people would rather have an electric shock than be yeah. alone with their thoughts yeah I mean, it, that kind of feeds into why you see so much of the herd mentality on social mm. media, you know. Let's which dig I can't, into that. Yeah, I can't. algorithms and yeah. and echo chambers oh, and I herd mentality. Even, yeah. I was having a conversation with uh, someone recently who was not on social media, which I love surrounding myself with people like that because they got such a different insight yeah. into into stuff. Um, and he was like, so like, how does this algorithm stuff work? And I was talking about, it, I was like, so you, you know, you like something, the algorithm learns that you like that, it gives you more of that stuff. And he was like, oh, so that's why people think opinion is fact. 
And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how, how do you manage that? Because obviously your, your content is very specific, but also very inclusive as well. So how do you fight that algorithm and get people to know who you are and also spread your message without falling into the trap of like, I have to get more likes? I think uh, it used to be more in- uh, inclusive, actually, than it is now, if I'm being honest, because now I'm just a bit like, do you know what, actually, it. it's not a democracy, like, I I have an opinion, you don't have to agree with it, like, if, if, you wa- if you feel strongly about whatever it is that you feel strongly about, I encourage you to go and start your own page and... Unfollow me. And, no, and do whatever you need <laughs> to do to protect yourself, like, mm. if you find me triggering in mm. any way. I don't, I don't set out to be offensive or I don't set out to be, um, you know, provocative just for the sake of it at all, actually. But sometimes I'll have a strong opinion about something. So, you know, um, I don't know. Look, it's been a, it's been a journey, you know. I remember at the very beginning not knowing anything about algorithms or how, how social media works at all. And the first time... I received negativity about something was actually when the Daily Mail <laughs> exactly did like the first article about me and they shared one of my videos and I think it was probably a video something along the lines of um, I love my kids especially when they're asleep <laughs> something along like totally lines. relatable by the way right? for the parents <laughs> I'm like I love them especially when so they're quiet so much <laughs> so much you come in and they're like oh they're so lovely and like an hour before you were like go to bed go to bed I can't do this you know so it was one of those videos and I was like oh my god I can't believe it like the Daily Mail this is an article about me and I go on and I log on and I you didn't read the, the comments, article you? and I went oh, to see no. the comments because I was so naive I was like this is great oh gosh and comment after comment was just the most horrific thing mm. I've ever read and they were so mean it wasn't even like oh I didn't like the video because I think her acting's awful like in me for me it's a performance mm, mm. so it was like okay if you, you didn't like your my performance maybe you don't think the lighting was great <laughs> the editing was shit the sound didn't work like something they were like personal She's the worst mother. Mm-hmm. Her kids need to be taken away to so my social services. Her children will kill themselves one day. Like, wow. the most horrific things. People are so horrible on the internet, you know? And, of course, I cried. Mm. I, I just burst out into tears. Because especially when like, I mentioned yeah. your family. And especially stuff, yeah. when they mention your children. Like, don't talk about me. Oh, God, I've been called everything under the sun. Honestly, I don't care. Yeah. But don't talk about my children. Like, that's that really got to me. And... My husband, Mike's an agent. He represents comedian. He's been in the show business for probably over 30 years. So mm. I obviously called him and I was like, oh, I, 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 they mm. hate me, my children. Uh, what have I done? Can mm. we get it off? Like, can we <laughs> tell them to erase the article? Like, this is so bad. And he, he said to me, Tova, the number one rule of showbiz is never read the comments. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you don't read the comments. Mm. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, don't read the comments. <laughs> Honestly, people are idiots. They'll say, like, the worst thing. So my community, obviously, is lovely. I do get the odd kind of, you know, negativity. I've learned to ignore it because Mm. it's better to ignore it than to fuel it. Mm. If you engage with those comments, those are the ones that will write to the top and then they'll they'll be, you know, whatever. Sometimes it's hard to do because all you want to do is like, well, actually, this is what I think. How how do you stop yourself from doing that? I'll write a really long thing and then I'll delete it. (laughs) No, I won't post it. I'll write it. And then I'll go, namaste, (sighs) delete (laughs) it. But I love blocking people. I love it. And then they come to another platform and go, you block me. And I'm like, yeah. It's like, you're a dick. <laughs> why would I let... It's like, let's say you came to my house and you started rubbing shit on my walls and, you know, insulting my family, you know, tossing and, you know, throwing around furniture. Do you think I would not ask you to leave? Mm-hmm. Like, I would. So why in a virtual world, why in my virtual home? Like, this is mm-hmm. my platform. It's my home, right? Mm-hmm. Virtual. Why do you think you can come here and just be, you know, throw shit at me and I'm just going to take it? No. Mm-hmm. So I block, 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 block. Sometimes people will threaten to leave. I just block. <laughs> don't worry. I've done I've it, got for, it you. for you. Don't Goodbye. worry. It's the fine. Yeah, it's not a problem, you know. And I got loads of fallouts 
over big issues like you know women's reproductive rights abortions a massive massive thing i have a big following in the states so that's very very polarizing anytime i'll put out like abortion thing anything i've made so many videos about abortions now you get a massive falling out i told i talked a lot about trump uh several times that always had a massive falling out but never in the history was the falling out as big as it was over Johnny Depp and Amber Heard which made me laugh because That's I thought crazy. seriously of you, all the things you, you care <laughs> less about abortions what is wrong with people where are you on the yeah it's like so many it, yeah it was quite interesting actually to see how strongly people felt about it mm. but I go back to what you said Uh, I think there is a confusion online between fact and opinion, you know. There is a confusion. Definitely. Um, and also, I think it's very sad that we've lost the art of conversation, that we can't actually disagree and, mm. and, and have a conversation. The idea that one person is right and another person is wrong in the conversation about a topic, I mean, right, is so absurd to me. Mm. Like there's a right opinion and it's so black and white that there are no areas that we can go, okay, well, that's interesting. Okay, I, I need to think about that. Um, uh, you know, I, I have some questions. I'm going to go and research this bit because I'm not sure. You know, where is all of that? Like that doesn't happen. Anymore. This is something I'm so passionate about. Um, particularly as we live in this world, as you say, that is in reality so black. Like, yeah. when I say reality, I mean like people perceive it to be so black and white. You're right, I'm wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. But actually, the world we live in is all, is well, on paper, is meant to be all about inclusivity and like yeah. listening to other people's perspectives and like respecting other people's choices and like all this kind of stuff. And it's like, actually, I feel like the more we're going down this route of you know, we all need to respect one another, actually the more disrespectful we're yeah. becoming. Um, and growing up, like the thing that I took from my childhood, and I don't know if you can, re you know, we'll dig into a childhood in a minute, but the gift that my parents gave me was debate. Mm. Like we would sit around and dine, and we still do. And it's very scary sometimes to like, you know, men I bring home or like, you know, to meet my family and stuff. Cause they're like, what the fuck? Like <laughs> we'll be all around the dinner table, like debate, not arguing, but debating passionately about stuff like about abortions, about the gun laws, about Boris Johnson and the government, about my, all the things that you're not meant to talk about around the dinner table. My parents encouraged us to talk about because they were like, look, my dad, my dad said this to me when I was like 17. I thought it was so profound and I still do. He said, I might not agree with your opinion. In fact, I'm probably never going to agree with your opinion. So if, I mean, then we were very, you know, 17 year old and a 45 year old at the time was like slightly opposite ends, shall we say, yeah. of the political spectrum. He said, I might not ever agree with your opinion, but I will fight to the death for your right to have one. Yeah. And like growing up in that environment has probably meant, you know, probably got me to where I am today. Because like you, I built my brand purely off being like, here's what I think. What do you think? I don't give a fuck whether someone agrees with me or not, but that's my opinion. doesn't mean it's the right one, but it's my opinion and mm. I have a right to have that. Um, so how do you, how do you manage that? How do you manage, you know, clicking post on the stuff that you're like, fuck, this is like punchy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that I'm not going to throw myself into any, every conversation because I'm not necessarily passionate about every, every polarizing topic. Which is also important, and right? Yeah. And Being like, I don't about, know. Yeah. Yeah. And there's plenty of stuff out there that I've never commented about. Ugh. And then you get people going, why haven't you said anything? I don't want to. That's yeah. why. I got like, a lot of, I got a lot I, of that about to. Ukraine and yeah. about um, the, there was a couple of other stuff that people were thinking, why haven't you mentioned this? I'm like, I don't know enough about it. I don't yeah. want to be that person that's just spreading information on social media that's not true. Yeah, and I think if you're sat at home just kind of like uh, going, uh, doing the rounds to see what who what public figures haven't used their platform to promote the cause that you feel very passionate mm -hmm. about, then you're, you're, you're wasting your energy in the wrong place because really what you should be doing is Doing it yourself. Yeah, doing it yourself. Just go, set up the GoFundMe page, mm. get your friends and family involved. Like, there's so much in people can do. Mm. They don't have to just wait for public figures to do it. I do think it's great that people want their public figures to do more. Absolutely. Mm. And I think more people should. But you can't be the police. You can't police people in that way. And I, I feel like people do that all the time. I'm just like, I'm not getting involved. But when things, when there are topics that I'm very, that are, I'm passionate about or touch on things that I'm passionate about then yeah I'll jump in um, 
normally I'll try to I'll try to see like what if I can see another perspective because I think that because we are trained and I think our brains are just trained that way to see things as a yes or no black or white are you on this team or that team it's labeling like, helps us understand. yeah it helps us understand so i think it's it's nice to just try and see well is there another angle here is there another perspective to just shed light over like throw into the mix and then people still by the way will label me they'll still go oh because you didn't say this or you didn't say that so that means you're this and i'm just like read the freaking post i get people say to me actually i didn't even bother reading it, it was so long I got the idea. And I'm like, but you only got the idea from the free comments you read. Like, that's mm. pathetic. What, I'm not going to, I can't even engage with that. Mm. I'm sorry, but for me, that's pure stupidity. Like, it's lazy. I, it's lazy and it's stupid and it's a waste of my time, you know. But it was, it's interesting to see how quickly, listen, I'm, I'm like a, I'm, I'm just a, you know, my platforms are not big. I can understand why people who have massive platforms you know, feel quite worried and scared because they're scared of getting canceled. I don't think I'm famous enough to ever be canceled, if I'm being honest. And even if I were, I, I, you know, I'll move on to my next career. Like, I'm not saying like I, I wouldn't, this would be awful to lose. Of course it would. But I'm not... I'm not it's attached not to it in the way that like it happened. It's great. I'm riding the wave as far as I, it can take me. But I'm also very, very open to the possibility that in 10 years time, I'll be doing something totally different, mm. potentially out of choice because I get bored quite mm. quickly. And I've been doing this for a long time, mm. you know, but I can understand why people who, you know, have massive platforms, careers that rely on studios seeing that they are popular with the people would be scared to say something that might get them canceled i think that's very sad it's okay. sad that we've reached that point where people and i am at, it's not and also let's face it free speech the term has been hijacked now mm. and it's you can't even say free speech without having without it having like a very negative connotation so i think we should separate between free speech and hate speech mm. not every ha free speech is hate speech you can't just have an opinion that is inquisitive curious uh, and middle ground. A lot of the times, it's actually the middle ground that gets Most shut down. Most of us are yeah. the middle ground. It's like middle well. ground. People going, okay, okay, I, I see points on both sides. I'd like to have a conversation. Let's sit around the table and see if we can figure it out. Mm. You know. But those are the voices that get shut down. So really what we're left is with extreme voices who rule social media. I, I can't stand it. Mm. I just, it, it does my head in. I just don't understand how we came to this point. <laughs> really. And I, it's so hard, by the way, because I see it sometimes. I'm like, oh, I want to get involved. But then I go, but there's no point. Because I know, I know that people won't get it. I know, you know. It's, it's like when people you People say... tagging me on things. And I'm like, oh, I just, I don't know. You it's know? like when you get like trolling messages or like I get, um, you know, like I was saying one before we started recording, like someone posted a, there's this is one person in particular who constantly mocks my content on, and that's his MO, like he, he loves doing it. And part of me wants to be like, jealous much. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But like, on the other half of me, it's like, is that gonna teach him a lesson? No. So like, in putting my energy into that, isn't gonna make the situation better. Yeah. If anything, it's just gonna piss me off more. So like you said, like block, I'm just like, done, yeah. move on. How did you get into social media is what I want to know. Because we've spoken about like your journey and like the self-discovery and like you kind of come to this realization of like, oh, I can do this thing online and this is quite cool. How did you start posting and, you know, practically, where did you get the balls to do it? Because I think a lot of people want to, like they might see you or, you know, other other figures that they enjoy following and, and really like, oh, wow, like I can really relate to this. Like I'd love to do that, but don't have the confidence or know where to start. So how did you start? So after I did that, those videos, I started on Facebook and I sort of had the first viral videos and Facebook kind and of And that exploded. was your bucket list videos? Uh, no, so the, no, that was before. So that was like the parenting videos Fine. and all that. Um, I, I, I wasn't on Instagram. Like, I, honestly, I, I don't like social media. I think it's terrible. <laughs> I honestly, if anybody's thinking of getting into it, don't. That is <laughs> don't my do advice. it. <laughs> don't do it. It's horrible. Like it's not. I love the community aspect mm. of it. Um, 
So like I still, I like groups, I like the idea of groups and I like the community aspect of it. But my hope is we're moving to Portugal in the summer. I don't know if you know this. Full time? Yeah, yeah. <gasps> we're moving to Portugal. That's so exciting. So my hope is that when I go out there, I'm going to just bring people out there. Like start, you start like bring people into the real world out of the virtual world. So do retreats mm. and get like members of my community to just come out on these amazing weeks amazing. whereby it's all about empowering celebrating giving permission fuck it all of that you know that. it's not sex parties by the way that, that'll be the next thing <laughs> cannot wait you know when you know cannot what, wait you know what Tova said a minute ago in 10 years she's going to be bored of doing what she's exactly. doing now. <laughs> cannot wait uh, for that to be my next career but uh but uh yeah so um and then I, I I got in with another agency who said to me, oh, you need to do Instagram. You need to go on Instagram. So I set up Instagram. And then during the pandemic, I saw, I discovered TikTok, like as everybody Which, did. Which, by the way. Yeah. Obsessed. Yeah. So I went on TikTok and yeah, and just, uh, I guess, started doing the whole thing. Um, uh, but... Um, you know, I've, I never really had a plan, which I guess is not really good. And it's taken me a while to see, okay, what am I apart from like creating mm. content on social media? Um, so I did, uh, I wrote a one woman show, uh, by the way, after the book came out. So I wrote a one woman show, which was based on the book, Fucked at uh, 40. And I toured America and I did like a few shows in England as well, which was amazing. It was such a great experience. It was so much fun. And then uh, my second book came out two years later, uh, You Did What, which was a collection of confessions and stories from everyday people, like people from all over the world sending these secrets, deep secrets that they keep. And a lot of them are very funny, some of them not so much, like quite deep, quite dark. Uh, but I did that because for years I did something on Facebook called Pajama Party and Confessions. So Friday nights I would just like get quite wasted in my bed live on Facebook I while I read out confessions from around the world I people sent that. in it was lots of fun and I had guests come on the show and all of that I did that for a few years while the kids were really small we didn't go out yeah. so that was my big night out <laughs> in my it's like mom's night out of it was great we're yeah. actually going to be launching a podcast on behalf of the cl- of the company not m- me yeah. um, soon which is going to be called Drunk Marketing Yeah, and it's literally a similar concept like <laughs> it's going to be me and Danielle or who's our social media manager or Danielle and someone else just reading out stuff that's happened in the news just pissed oh, <laughs> like, and just talking about yeah. it so obsessed with it that was idea. great Amazing. and but what it taught me by the way was that and i have read thousands of confessions now honestly from everywhere in the world and when i say everywhere i mean everywhere mm-hmm. and what it taught me was that we all hide the same secrets mm-hmm. like people are so much more like each other than we ever think mm. you know and most of the confessions are oh god I'm so embarrassed to admit this but oh, I do this and then you'll have people in the comments go oh I do it too oh, <laughs> I've done it I know someone who's done it like you suddenly realize oh god I'm not alone and the thing about secrets I think is that it can cause a lot of shame mm. so if you're carrying a deep dark secret and you think is just you in the world it might cause a lot of shame uh, so having been able, being able to say that, I think is a real relief. Um, so I, I did a few shows based on that book, and I'm doing one more on the seventh of July. Um, so it's my in London. Uh, tickets are on sale now. T- tickets are on sale. I'm already tickets sent the link to our, <laughs> to our team and said, "Can we get some of these exactly. tickets?" Please? <laughs> and it's uh, yeah. So what and and what's to come apart from the retreats that I'm thinking of when we do go to Portugal is. You know, I, I, I really want to I really want to do something that um, that makes people feel great, but just the way they are. I don't believe in the whole like we need to fix things. You know, I, I know that's like therapy, basically. <laughs> no, but I hate, but isn't I that, hate that mentality. I like, yeah, you need that you to need, to need to be this, broken to fix yourself. Yeah. Like, why don't you just work on yourself? Yeah, or just like I, you know. It's easier when you give a specific example. Mm. So for me, the example, the easiest example is motherhood. Mm. I don't know if this is, if you relate to this or not, but for me, for years, I thought I was a terrible mother. Mm. I had awful mom guilt. I still guilt. do. I get mom guilt all the time. I thought I was the worst mother that ever lived. Mm. Okay. Literally, because I wasn't 
the way that I thought mothers were supposed to be. I don't like baking. I hate... I don't do good mom activities. I hate. I hate yeah, messy yeah. play. I hate soft play. I hate all the type of play. It's like, I'm not... It's not me. I hate it. I don't I don't like it. I'm also quite an... I'm not a patient person in general. And kids need a lot of patience. You know, it's... It, it's lots of things just didn't stack up. Uh, but I adore my children. Mm. I love my children. And they and I talk to them openly about stuff. And there's lots of things that I do enjoy doing with them. Just not the typical what you're supposed to be. So that made me feel like I was a really bad mom. And in the process, I have come to... And this is like I'm saying it really quick. Because we can't like talk about everything that happened that made me reach that point. Mm. I realized that I am a great mother. Mm. I'm a fucking amazing mother. I'm the best mother for my children. I am my type of motherhood. Mm. There isn't one type of motherhood. You're unique in your motherhood. She's unique in her motherhood. We're all mm. unique in our motherhood. As long I'm not, you know, you're, you love your, your kids, your kids are safe, and they're looked after, you're a fucking brilliant mom. And if you've had a nanny to help you, good on you. If you've had your mom who helps you, or your parents, your parents-in-law who cares amazing your kids are looked after you're a great mom it took a long time to reach that point but my point is I didn't fix anything mm -hmm. I didn't change anything about my motherhood it was all about my perspective how I saw my motherhood so mm -hmm. I'm launching a, a an online course that's called ignite your fuck it attitude and it's all about permission mm -hmm. giving yourself permission to be yourself mm -hmm. to just be yourself without this stupid idea that you have to fix things mm -hmm. you know so I talk about body image in that and I talk about motherhood um, and I just talk about different aspects that I that were part of my journey mm -hmm. obviously people will have different things and that's launching very very soon I'm so excited about this my first kind of really putting into the world a project a, 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 you know like a, a product but it's a virtual product because I hate stuff <laughs> <laughs> so this doesn't take up any space um, and I really hope people enjoy it. You know, I've invested loads of time in this. I'm very, very um, nervous, but uh, hopefully it'll land well. Don't be nervous. Yeah. I have every, <laughs> every confidence all over. Even just being next to you and talking to you is like in inspiring. So I've no doubt that yeah, the, the course is so. going to be amazing. Um, but yeah, I, to go back to your, your thing about people wanting to fix it, I really do think that. And it kind of goes full circle, I guess, to where we first started the conversation, which was around like society telling you you need things to feel good about yourself. I think people go through life changing their motherhood behavior or changing their, you know, external stuff, hoping that it's going to fix how they feel. But actually the thing you need to yeah. change is, is how is you, like how you see things, not the things around you or your behavior or anything like that. It's like just changing your perspective is changes everything. And I think even like, even to try and change your perspective is like, uh, you know, it's almost like mission impossible, right? So mm -hmm. in fact, it's letting go of the idea of even changing that. Mm -hmm. It's just being, but not in like a, let's sit and meditate, because that's not for me either. The for, weird stuff. Yeah, it wasn't about that. For me, it was just about, well, what actually is fun? Mm. Like what just, um, what do I enjoy? And I don't have to make a list and oh, you have to do this. No, it was literally small things. It can start from just, it, you know what it is though? It really is giving yourself just some permission to just do whatever the fuck you want. If you want to stay in bed tonight, today in your pajamas and watch like, you know, the holiday over and over again, I've had days like that, brilliant, do it. If you want to, you know, slack it, slack, like not, you know, start your work day quite late and go and have a walk in the woods, just do it. Like, it's allowing, obviously, to the ability of what you can do, of mm. course, but like, it, it, I think it's just the allowing that space because we're so... We're, we're so consumed with the idea that there's certain things that we need to be doing. Mm. You know that, do you know those articles of like, by 30, you need to be doing this. By 40, you need to be doing that. By 50, you know, that type of thing. It's so exhausting. It's Instagram that perpetuates that. Yeah. I see those lists come up on like, at success motivation, whatever, all the time. And I'm like, guys, do you know Colonel Sanders started KFC at 65? You have fucking time. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. And also the idea of pleasure, by yeah. the way. Like I talk a lot about pleasure also in the book, but also in the, in the online course. Just that idea of what is pleasure. Mm. I didn't even think about pleasure, you know, for, and, and we can talk about sexual pleasure, but like any type of pleasure, it can be anything. It can be a touch, a hug, a, you know, uh, 
I don't know, a warm bath, mm. you know, just giving yourself that kind of 20 minutes at the end of the day to really soak in mm. a nice bath with some lovely salts or whatever. It's not a lot of time, you know, because because the idea of like uh, dedicating time to yourself, then you think, oh, God, I need to go to a spa for four mm. days. No, you don't. Self care can, can, can be can be a walk, yeah, can, be can be anything. Whacking on a face mask and to, shutting yeah, the door and having a wee in peace without your children being like, "Mommy!" Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what I equivalent it to? I remember when I when uh, my daughter first uh, uh, daughter was born, she was four months old, and I did a show in Edinburgh. And uh, at, up to that point, I was really like a very control freak type of mom. Like I was the only one allowed to do anything. My husband didn't do anything because I, I was so scared mm. that he wouldn't do it right. Or, uh, you know, I, it was very hard for me to let go of the control. And I did this show and I had to go into the theater every night, right, to do this show. And I was like, oh, God, how's, how is he going to manage? He needs to, how's she going to live? <laughs> really, he needs to do the feed. He needs to shave, do the bath, bath, you know. He's never done bath time alone. She, you know, he's going to kill her. This is awful. <laughs> And the first night, I literally left so late, I nearly missed, you know, the beginning. And, um, and I was like, rushed home. And I got home, and she was absolutely fine, obviously, in bed, completely fine. And then every day for that run, I started leaving earlier and earlier and earlier until by the end of the run, I literally would leave like four hours before go to a Starbucks, just <laughs> sit there lapping life. It was great. So it's a bit like that. You have to practice the, the, the permission. You have to practice that kind of self-care just in a sense of start tiny. Mm. And, and if it feels nice, maybe the next day you'll do it for a little longer. You know, like, and, and don't aim for doing it longer. It just might happen, mm. you know, and maybe it won't. But do you know what I mean? So that was the same for me. I started with, some, with really small things that suddenly grew and they grew and they grew and then it just becomes part of, of you and the mm. same came, happened with the motherhood stuff you know it, it, it took so long to give myself that kind of I did okay today you know I, 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 did, I had that moment today that moment was good I'm gonna focus on that moment I'm not gonna think about that other moment where I lost my shit like mm. we had to go in the cupboard <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna focus on that moment and then there's more moments and suddenly you see those moments more and yeah, you know, I, I, I know that I, we all, we're, no, no, none of us are perfect, obviously, but I, I, I like the type of mom that I am now. Like it's, it's good. And I haven't changed. I'm the same type of mom that I was. I love that so much. And I can yeah. really relate to you on the mom, the mom yeah. topic period, but also what you were just describing there about like leaving a little bit later, a little bit later. I immediately thought of like my my running this business. Yeah. So like it's been so because it's my business, right? It's been really hard, and I'm sure there are so many founders that can relate to this, but really hard to like let go of specific things. Um, and it was that like little babysit, little babysit, little babysit. And then I went on holiday a couple of weeks ago, and it was the first vacation I'd been on like 18 months, and I was so burnt out, so tired. Yeah. And it got to like the Friday before I was going, and I hadn't finished all my work, and the work being approving stuff and making sure stuff was done right and like by right I mean like in my way um and I just thought either I can kill myself before I go on vacation and just fuck up my vacation because I've killed myself to get this done or I can just go cool just define how it is and just sort it out and I was like you know what I'm just gonna go it's fine how it is and then sort it out and it was the best decision I've, oh. like I've come back from vacation almost like a completely different leader That's because great. I'm now completely trusting the team just to crack on and do their jobs and there's no like I have to prove everything no god it goes yeah. and I'm like why the fuck didn't I do this like two years ago or yeah. like eight months ago or whatever it might be it just makes me like you said you're giving yourself the permission but also them the permission and you know your kids the permission and your husband the permission or whatever to do what they need to do as well um, which obviously in turn helps you yeah be the best you can be and even in motherhood again uh, for anyone who's like you know is listening and I can I can think about that with in regards with motherhood as well the idea of having to do it all by yourself mm. as and a you mom feel like you have to and you, you feel like you have to because that's what you were told or taught or whatever um, not true, you know. We had, uh, when the twins were born, and honestly, I, I think I went through, like, a, nearly, a ner I nearly had a nervous breakdown. Like, mm. it was so hard. I had preeclampsia. I was in hospital mm. for two months while my daughter, not even two, at home. Like, mm. it was really hard. So by the end of it, when I came out, I was really broken. And thankfully, I recognized it immediately mm. because of the experience with the postpartum mm -hmm. depression. I recognized it immediately. Literally, day three, I turned around to Mike and I said, uh, "We, I need help. Like, we need help. And 
I, 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 I'm, I, I, we, it's either me mm. or the money that we have saved up because I know I can't survive this. Mm. I won't, I won't be able to do it. I knew that I couldn't do it. So we had, we had like a bit of savings, like we went, all of it went on a night nurse. <laughs> Which by the way, I have with my first game changer. It's a game changer. And I would rather spend money on the night nurse than on so anything good. else. Like, yeah. Designers like no, <laughs> and I still nurse. felt loads of guilt by the way because there was the criticism. We had a nanny after it wasn't a nanny, it was like a mother's help, so yeah, she would yeah. come in for a few hours, and that was amazing as well. And uh, I wrote a post about it, you know, I wrote a post about like, well, I have a nanny, I'm not sorry, and then of course, you know, and that got picked up by the Huffington Post, by the Huff Post and it all like lo- it did the surf, it did mm-hmm. everything. And people would say, like, oh, so what did why did you have kids for then if your nanny's raising them? And you, you just said that the, they prefer the nanny then they prefer you and all and I just thought and then I felt bad and then I met a few women who had twins and of course they didn't have nannies and I felt even worse and I thought oh you see well it was doable so why was I so what a loser am I like that I couldn't do it by myself and then they sort of said to me Tova one of them told me I had a a nervous breakdown Mm -hmm. like I was I was a wreck of a person, a shell of a person. If I could go back, I would 100% have help. Mm. And they they shared their stories with me of how they regretted not having the help because they didn't think that they could. Mm. And actually, in retrospect, they would have. And, you know, it's really important to have those conversations with women because we do hide it. A lot of the times... Shame. It's such a shame. Mm. A lot of the times when you open up to, and tell another woman like how you're really feeling, because we all kind of look perfect, like, like we, we've got it figured out on the outside, but most of us struggle with the same things, you know? Mm. So that was very helpful, you know, to sort of go, okay, well, now I see it differently, of course. I see it like I made the right choice. We made the right cho- choice for our family. Mm. And really, it's no one's business, really. But at the time, it was hard to kind of, yeah, it was hard to... Almost like you felt like you had to justify it. Oh, God, yeah. I hate that. So much. I felt like that too. Like, my kid, I'm very, very blessed that I'm in a position where, you know, my son can go to nursery and their nursery is amazing. And, like, it's, you know, whatever. My daughter does Breakfast Club and... Which is why this podcast recording started a little bit later than it needed (laughs) to because the Breakfast Club wasn't on today because it was their first day back. But, um, and, you know, she can go to Breakfast Club and After School Club, but... Like without that, and yeah. there is a level of guilt there. I'll be honest, of me being like, and you, start, you I tell people that with friends who pick up their kids at like three thirty, which is like end time, being like, oh, that's a very long day for your kids. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, it is a long day, but guess what? Like, mummy has to work, and mummy's yeah. got shit to do. My kids love me. I love them. They're safe. They're happy. They don't complain. So, yeah, but also, what's interesting is that they'll never say it to dad. Ever. Ever. Um, And I actually had a a real uh, eureka moment with mom guilt that had to do with Mike and and this kind of mom guilt versus dad guilt, which is a thing, by the way, but Mm. not as as common. We both, at some point, forgot our daughter's um, birthday assembly at school. So So easy to do. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's not a big event. You know, it's not like there's cake or anything. They just mention the names of the kids that have a birthday that week. So... There I am walking with the dog. I get a phone call from a friend, another mom, and she goes, where are you? Because her child has a birthday in the same week as mm. us, so she was there. And I go, what do you mean? And she goes, it's the birthday assembly. They're about to sort of get their certificates. And I was like, shit. So I start running to the school, and I'm like 15 minutes away, mm. right? Running to the school, carrying the dog. And I, I call Mike on this phone, and he's like, he's with the car somewhere you know, else. And I was like you have to get to the school like one of us needs to get there first so he turns around he starts he's driving to the school we both literally arrive at the same time <gasps> you know running into the school oh you know I'm, I'm literally having a heart attack and we made it mm. she gets the certificate we see it it's all fine she never knew okay but this is the story as we walk out of the school my internal monologue is what a awful mother I am who fucking forgets her own child's birthday assembly this is horrendous big mom fail I'm beating myself up and we're walking like in silence and suddenly Mike says he goes wow we are such great parents what a reframe and I was like what I was in shock I was like what what do you mean and he goes the way we dropped everything in our day, like I was on my way to a meeting, you were like, no, you would like ran for 15 minutes. We dropped everything to go and be there for her assembly. My parents would have never done that. And I just went, wow, mm. what a great perspective. We, we forgot. It's human. 
You made a mistake. We forgot. But we did everything to go and be there for her. And that's what she's going to remember. And he gave himself that credit. And that's something that men are so good at. You know, women, we as women, I think, could really learn a lot from that type of just seeing your success, learning from the, you know, the moments that you maybe didn't do as good, but mm. actually focusing on the, the good. We, we're, we're so harsh on ourselves. So that was a massive game changer for me and how what I saw my... Reframe. Yeah, I love that. It was so great much. reframe. Yeah. Really nice segue. I'm like conscious of time, but I want to talk about feminism because yeah. it's such an important topic to me and it's such an important topic to you. What does feminism mean to you? Wow. It's such a dirty word now. <laughs> I know. Like, it needs a rebrand. <laughs> yeah, it needs concerned. a rebrand. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, well, we know what it means, right? So equal rights. Um... I, 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 I love advocating for women. I want, um, you know, I, I, I think that some people don't like when you say we don't have equal rights uh, because they think that it puts uh, us in a position of being victims and mm. sort of like the weak, a weak, weak or, you know, I don't see it that way at all. For the same all, reason why people don't like the word privilege because yeah. I'm like, I'm not privileged. I didn't grow up. With yeah, I mean, I'm like, I don't, I don't see it that way. First of all, I think you can't avoid facts, mm. and it is a fact, and it's a very upsetting fact. And I understand why we don't like that fact, but it's the truth. Also, I think that when you, I get a lot of uh, people saying to me, "Oh, Tova, why do you keep going on about you can do what you want? You know, you you don't like you you know your husband looks after the kids. Like you've got equality a lot." And I say, yeah. I do, but there are so many women who don't. Like, don't even look at this kind I mean, in this country even, but, and in, in Western world, yeah, but even other parts of the world, how can you say that? You know, women in Afghanistan are completely now being stripped mm. from the rights that they've had for the last 20 years. Like, it's the most devastating, um, you know, what's going on now with women now in Afghanistan is absolutely devastating. And, it's and that's just we one we won't yeah. know about now because of all the other news yeah. moved on. So it's important. That moved on. No one cares. And even in America, when you think about, you know, the, the, the abortion, abortion bans and not just America, Poland, the, the last couple of years, so many places in the world. No, women do not have equal rights. They, we do not have equal rights. Uh, and I don't see how, as a woman, I could ever stop talking about that until every single girl in the world feels safe, mm. has every opportunity to, to, to be whoever and whatever she wants. And when I think about equal rights, you know, then people get really picky. Eh, so do you think men and women are the same? Stop. Mm. Stop. Let's just move on from that stupid conversation. I don't want to engage in that type of idiotic conversation. That's mm. not what it means. It means equal opportunities mm. it means the right to a you know to respect safety it, it means so many other things i don't i don't like that uh when people try to drag they, tr they try to drag the conversation down and i don't like that mm. um and i think v i feel very strongly also because i'm a mom of girls uh you know i feel like i want them to 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 grow up in a in a better world mm. um so yeah so that's what it means to me. <laughs> what does it mean to you? I think it's interesting, actually. I, sp I spoke to my friend the other day. We were having a very similar conversation to this, just like over a glass of wine. And I said to her, um, you know, like, I, like I'm such a bra burning feminist. Like I'm, I want to be on the picket line, like for the same reasons as you. I have loads of opportunity. I have. Mm. I'm probably the most have the most opportunity of any woman in the world, not individually, but as a, as a set yeah. of you, because I'm white middle class, grew up in the UK. Yeah. And have had the privilege to be able to start a business like this and stand on my own two feet. There are many women in the world that don't have those opportunities. And I said to you, know, so I'm such a feminist, I feel like I want you to talk about it. And she goes, well, I'm not a feminist. And I was like, what? Like, I was shocked that she yeah. said that. And she was like, I'm not a feminist. I was like, what do you, but what do you, like, my brain's like, what does she mean? Like, trying to, like, like spin around, trying yeah. to figure out what she's talking about. And she's like, you know, I shave my armpits and, like, I don't drink beer. And I was like... What? And this is a very intelligent, yeah. very intelligent woman. Right? She's having, the CEO of a business. having a choice. Do what and you I want. And I said, you do realize feminism yeah. at its core is about equal rights. And she was like, oh, yeah, like, I believe in women's equal rights. I was like, the so you are a feminist then? And she was like, yeah, I suppose I am. And I was like, we need to have this yeah. conversation so people realize what feminism means. Like, yeah. it's not what you think it is. It's literally, and, and men, by the way, can be feminists too. Oh, yeah. And they totally. should be. 
Yeah. They should be. Mike's a feminist. He will def- he will say about himself that he's a feminist. He's a member of the Women's Equality Party. I love that. I Go all, Mike. <laughs> yeah, all men should be because if you are, a, why wouldn't you? And I don't like also the idea of, uh, um, you know, men becoming uh, a bit more aware of women's rights only when they become fathers of daughters. Or get married. You've or... got a mother. Yeah, yeah. You've got a sister. You've got an aunt. You've got a wife. You've got women in your life. Co-workers, yeah, these, yeah, these are your fellow humans. It's not like, oh God, well now I'm a dad and I got a girl. Oh yeah, I don't like it that there's predators out there. You shouldn't have liked it before. Mm. Like, no, mm. you know. I think men do have to play a much bigger part actually in mm. the conversation than mm. they do. I think that um, some of them don't because they don't think it's their place. Mm. Uh, and some of them don't because it, they feel like it doesn't affect them, mm. you know. But neither reasons actually are, are, are good enough. Like, or true. Yeah, or true. Mm. You, you, we, we need to really have the... This is for all our sakes, you know. Mm. Like, it's not just for women. Mm. Um, but then again, you know, Mike gets it so much at home because I, I honestly, I just don't shut up about these the topics and everything. And while he's completely with me and on the same page and, you know, he'll send me articles and whatever, he's not very vocal about it. And I I often have that conversation with him. Well, why? Like, what is the thing that stops you from, you know, going at... We haven't, we haven't nailed it yet. Like, I don't know. It's an ongoing conversation. It's very interesting. Because mm. I think, like, if someone like him, who I know is genuinely a feminist mm-hmm. and is married to me, who's, like, super vocal about it, and still doesn't feel like he can go out and be vocal by himself, then how would anyone else? Like, do you know what I mean? Do you think that's a confidence thing? I don't know. I don't know. He does post, like, stuff on his, like, personal Facebook. And I guess he's not a massive poster, like, Mm -hmm. just in general. But he did uh, have some interesting conversation with uh, conversations with people recently, again, about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, where he was the minority opinion Mm -hmm. around the table. Uh, so, you know, he, he did vocalize some of Good on him. this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. What's next for Tova? So everything I mentioned, the retreat and the... Please send me details of those. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm on Yeah, no, for sure. But the, I'm here for the, 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 the next ignite, thing... Ignition. <laughs> ignition, exactly. I think you're there. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's anything You've been ignited. Me back up that, I was like, yeah, for it. Um, no, so I think that, well, the next big thing is obviously the course, uh, the, um, the show. So that's on the 7th of uh, July. It's at the JW3. It's called You Did What? And we'll, um, put, we'll put the link to the tickets in yeah. the show notes. And it's well, a so. special one because actually it's the last show I'm doing in London before the Hopefully smooth. not the last show. And, but who knows for how long because we're going to go now for a couple of years. And I'll be back and forth, but I don't think I'll do any shows here for the next few years at least. Uh, and then the set, the next thing after that's going to be the launch of the of the Ignite Your Fuck It Attitude online course, um, which I'm so excited about. And we're going to create communities, so there'll be like a term where people start together and finish together, yeah. and at the end of every term there'll be a live with me, so that'll be on Zoom. And you know, I'm sure it'll be global, people from all over the world, which I always love because it's amazing to see like every, you know, it's like you've bought the best bit of social media. Of the yeah. community bit into your little fold. I'm hoping, and I really, I really hope that when we do get to do the retreats, once I'm there, and that's probably going to be next summer. I'm aiming for like next summer for that. The meeting people in real life is amazing. You love. You said you love that. Like that's love the best it. thing. Like that's why I, I yeah. think it's such a yeah. I was like, Can please do this in person because I fucking hate yeah yeah yeah. It's, like, it's lovely. It's really yeah. nice. And, and body language. Yeah. And like, like energy and yeah you just don't get that from and that's one of the things I love the most and during the shows I always do a meet and greet with you know people who who have booked that type of ticket but I also always stay after the show to sort of sign books and chat with people but it's so short but at least you get to you know to kind of have a bit of a conversation I love that Uh, so yeah so that's that's the plan the last question Um, and it's one that I ask everyone when they come (laughs) in I never tell them I'm going to ask it because I love it to be off the cuff (laughs) If you could go back, let's. I normally ask at twenty one, but let's go back to thirty because I feel like that's when your life changes. It changed. Mm. If you could go back to thirty and tell yourself three things, oh god, what would you tell yourself? So thirty was just after the divorce. I mean, I I really would have loved someone to say me to tell me you will love again because I didn't think I would. Um, I guess don't worry so much. 
And I would have loved to reach the fuck it. <laughs> Just accelerate Part of my life earlier. Yeah. yeah, if I could have had that like around 35, that would have been awesome. You know, Can't, it, I, it happened at 42. But yeah. I, what, what would you have told yourself? Eat cake. Oh yeah, I like that. Start a podcast, that'll be big. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yes. mess with some crypto. No, um, I, like eat the cake definitely because I had bulimia when I was younger. So oh, I was wow. just a conscious, yeah. always, my whole life revolved around food. Yeah. Um, in, in a negative way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's taken me to this fuck it stage of my life to actually be like, I'm going to have an extra scoop of ice cream and feel zero fucking, zero fucking fucks about it. Um, so that was, that was a, because it just made me miserable. It's just yeah. really awful. Just a whole mind just always thinking about food and then guilt and this whole horrible cycle. So that'd be the first thing, eat cake. Um, the second thing would be like, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Cause I feel like particularly as a woman, like, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about it in this, in this podcast, but particularly as a woman, there are so many expectations of like what you should be and what you should look like and what you should do and all this kind of stuff. And it's like if you feel like you're gearing off that course, like, oh my God, like I'm going to get shunned by my friends and society, whatever. But actually, what's the fucking worst that's going to happen? But actually, there is truth in that though. The worst, I think that, yeah, for women, uh, uh, there's a very big price to pay. There is. Again, going back to Amber Heard and Jack. Yeah. 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 You know, I think that women who, um, who, women who, are not liked by the public, let's just fucked. put it that way, are absolutely fucked. Yeah. Look at Monica Lewinsky. Like, women... We need to do a whole other it podcast It takes, on like, that. a lot, a lot. And I just want to say that when I, st- when I did the whole uh, Fucked at 40, I talk in my book as well about uh, marriage, and I mm-hmm. talk about monogamy. Mm-hmm. And I talk about how I don't believe in monogamy, mm-hmm. and about conversations I had with Mike about opening up our marriage and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And... The only reason I could get away, and, and this is true, by the way, about a lot of things that I talk about, masturbation, uh, anything that's a bit like out there, and even this political stuff, you know why I can get away with it? Not just because I'm a white woman in a Western world, blah, 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 but also because I'm a married woman mm. with a man that supports everything that I do. Mm. Would I be able to get away with it if I wasn't? If I was single or divorced, Mm. if I was, I don't know, some, something else. I don't know. Do you follow Serena Kerrigan? Um, no. You would love her. Okay. Yeah. She's a single American woman in her twenties. Okay. And she talks about all this stuff. Yeah. And I'm just obsessed. Okay. She's like my, love her. But yeah. yeah. Um, I love the third thing. And the the third third thing, thing, just fucking do it. Yeah. (laughs) Like literally just fucking do it. Yeah. I say it to people all the time. Like they go, oh, I'm thin. I'm like, just fucking do it. And they're like, okay, yeah. Because you're gonna die yeah. anyway, right? Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. So you may as well. Like it's so, so funny. I was posting sure something the other day, and I was like, my greatest motivation is death. And everyone's oh, like, yeah. whoa, I mean, that is morbid. Oh and I was like, God. no. I feel like, like I found my twin. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you're gonna die. So just pick something. That's and if it doesn't work, pick something else. That's the whole section in my show is about death. <laughs> yeah. And I say that, but it's the greatest motivator. Yeah. People think it's morbid, but it's not. I think about it literally every day. Yeah, every I day. I can die today, so okay. <laughs> my greatest fear in life is getting to yeah. the end of my life and thinking, yeah. fuck, I wish I'd done more stuff. Yeah. It terrifies me. Nothing else terrifies yeah. me. That only thing terrifies me. Have you seen those um, posters that you can get, which are like the weeks of your life, and you color them in? God, no. No. <laughs> No. Very motivating because it's like visualize how many weeks you have in your life and every week that passes. But how many weeks in. do you give yourself? Then? It's like what they average it out. So it's like 90. It's like based on about 85 to 90 years. They do it. Wow. It's very interesting. Wow. Wow. Tyra, thank you so much. I can literally keep talking to you for like another oh. three hours. I'm obsessed. I'm on and such a fangirl as well. Oh. So thank you so much for making the time and being so open and so honest. And yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. We thank do it you again. so much for having me. It was great.